one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Bill Henry? Here. Joseph Jones? Here. Connors? Present. Mike Jones? Here. Liberia? Here. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Okay. Discussion. Roll call. Bell Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Lafredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Motion to open the public hearing. Second. Roll call. Bell Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Lafredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Arms? Yes. This has to do with the publications publishing uh, the minutes, or not the minutes, but the agenda on three, four different locations, City Hall, Public Safety Building, IV, and also on the website. It's just to kind of correct everything that was out there in the ordinance or in, in any documentation. Is there any comment from the public? Council? Roll call. Need a motion to close. Move to close. Move to close. Second. Now we'll roll call. Bill Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Fredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Hart? Yes. Traffic follows. I put something red. <laughs> Next item is consideration of the first reading of Ordinance 1910. Amending the Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 1805 publications, the posting locations. Motion? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Bill Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Lafredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Barnes? Yes. We're pleased to have a special guest tonight, Mr. Greg Edwards of Catch Des Moines. Thank you, Mayor, good evening, Council, Chief, beloved guests, the thrill of your life is about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are Catch Des Moines, otherwise known as your Greater Des Moines Catch Industries Bureau. I'm very proud to represent the city of Windsor Heights, along with 15 other communities around the metro area. Kind of a recap uh, and update on where we stand and things that are happening with us in my um, our main mission is to bring in new visitors to the metro area. Visitors being meetings, conventions, sporting events, leisure travelers, business travelers, bus tours, etc. Obviously, what we do increases the economic value to all of our communities. <coughs> um, we've seen a lot of hotel growth throughout the metro. I'm sharing this graph with, with everybody I speak to anymore um, to show them the growth. Um, you can go back to as far as, actually go back to about 2009, so eight years, or excuse me, 10 years ago, um, we've grown by nearly 5,000 hotel rooms in the metro area. Um, our uh, estimation by the end of this year, we'll have a little over 13,000 rooms. Um, by the end of uh, 2022, we'll have over 14,000 rooms in the entire metro. New hotel developments also listed on this slide. Um, these hotels range from downtown hotels, the big being Hotel Fort Des Moines is planning to reopen sometime after the first of the year. Um, but there's uh, projects really throughout the entire metro area as they continue. Um, performance wise, hotel wise, um, we're holding our own with the increase of rooms. I'm happy to say we at least held on to occupancy levels and kind of increased occupancy levels slightly. Um, which is a good sign. I think the real key is that the demand of uh, number of rooms sold uh, still is up about, um, what, 80,000 some rooms over last year. So the demand is still strong, um, which is also a good sign for our industry. Our sales rise continue to increase too. Our board makes sure that we have aggressive sales goals um, annually. Um, our goal this year, or last year, was about 330-some bookings. Uh, we came in with 344 total bookings for the Metro. Um, this year, our goal is um, over 350 bookings. 
uh, an example of some of those bookings, and we concentrate a lot on what we call citywide business. Citywide business are groups that would occupy over 1,200 rooms on one given night. Uh, which obviously would impact the entire metro area. But some of the large citywide that we just completed this year were the uh, General Assembly of Christian Church Disciples of Christ that were here with uh, roughly about 6,000 people. Um, the Toyota USA Track and Field Championships, which were here last summer at Drake Stadium. Uh, the PEO Convention, International Convention, was held here just uh, a couple months ago that brought in over 5,000 people. And some of the things on the docket are USA Wrestling preseason nationals, obviously the presidential caucus, which we can't really claim that we booked that, but we do do a lot to support the, uh, the efforts of the caucus. Um, folk style wrestling championships, a big uh, volleyball tournament, which is the JBA Challenge, World Pork Expo, fingers crossed, we'll be back again next year. And one of the biggies we book for next year is the Ironman um, North American Championships. Uh, here in the metro. Um, major initiatives, uh, as I mentioned, we booked 353 new events last year. Uh, we hosted nine citywides. We meet with the hotel community periodically. That's the big thing they always say. We want more citywides. We want more citywides. Because obviously that does have such a huge impact on everybody in the metro. Um, nine is really kind of the ideal numbers to bring in. And that doesn't count the normal stuff that comes in over the year, like the Drake Relays or Drake Graduation, bad, uh, state basketball tournaments, state track and field championships. These are nine new business uh, pieces of conventions or sporting events that we draw in. Um, we're also in the works of unveiling our new destination master plan, which is a big strategic plan for us that's been ongoing since about February this year when we hired a company called JLL, you may be familiar with them in the commercial real estate business. They also have a tourism arm and they're doing these destination plans really throughout the world. Um, so they're coming back with us with a, a great synopsis on what are we going to do to not only sustain the tourism industry in the metro, but how are we going to grow it and continue to flourish in the next three to five years. We'll be um, rolling that out probably in the next couple of months once it goes back to our board um, we did create just recently what we call our customer advisory board. A lot of the larger CDBs across the country have these, and we just implemented one here. And this is where we brought in 14 different planners from across the country of all shapes and sizes, religious conference planners, agriculture convention planners, corporate planners, sports event planners, a good mixture of all kinds of different planners out there. We brought them in for a three-day seminar. We hired a facilitator. And we talked to them about what we have here in Des Moines, what we need here, what can we do to attract them in the future, their national connections primarily. We got some great feedback on that as well. So we're real happy with that. We also, just a couple months ago, you may have seen, launched our new ad campaign called The S's Are Silent. Um, how many times you get off an airplane and then flight attendant says, Welcome to Des Moines. And we all cringe, and then I have a little talk with them as I get off the plane. So the yeses are silent. Duh, Moines. Got it. Um, we also have established a new frontline trainings um, um, program that we started primarily for hotel frontline employees, restaurants, servers, whoever's really in the public hospitality field, training them on service techniques, what to talk about when they have a client that says, Oh, I'm from out of town, what's there to do this week, um, what's going on in the metro area, to talk about everything from new outlet malls to um, other developments in the metro and uh, some of the major attractions that we have here. Um, new regional projects, obviously we're heavily involved with the Central Iowa Water Trails project. Um, I think there's five of our staff members that I'm on the main board and other staff members are on the marketing and development other um, created boards. We're very active in the Lawrence and Skate Park. You probably heard a lot about the skate park. We're excited about that. It's going to be the largest skate park in the country. Um, we've been in contact with Red Bull, Mountain Dew, Monster, all these big companies that do all these huge skateboarding 
uh, the tournaments. The skateboarding in 2020 will be an Olympic sport as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, the Mid American Energy Rec Plex on West Des Moines is another huge thing for us. Bring in more sporting events, a lot of indoor stuff, more ice events, hockey in particular. Uh, the Des Moines Public Market, you've probably read the pros and cons of that if you still subscribe to the register. Um, working on that as well. And then, uh, of course, the soccer stadium. Now, there's no soccer stadium to talk about, um, but we're involved with the Kraus um, moving up the soccer league. So, as well. We send this out to you. It's, it's kind of disturbing to us as we're trying to figure out a better way to do this. But this is our monthly brief that we send to all of you, um, all the councils throughout the metro, about 200 plus people. The bad news is the open rate on this is 7%. So we can't figure out if this is going in people's spam or if people are going, oh, it's just another report. But this monthly report will show you all the activities for the previous month, what we're working on, where we did sales trips, the marketing campaigns that we're doing, what we booked that month, et cetera. So kind of an important piece. But we are revamping this. Um, I'm sure by after the first year you'll see a new format and uh, hopefully more people will read to catch up on what's going on with this. Um, bottom line, we created an economic impact to year end last year of $112 million uh, to the metro community. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. <clears throat> what impact do caucuses and primaries kind of have, on, have on your role? It has a huge impact. I think so. You know, in 2008, we joined with the Greater Des Moines Partnership and created the Iowa Caucus Consortium. <laughs> And if you go back to 2004 specifically, those were the years when you turn on the nightly news, the national news, and they'd say, live from Des Moines, Iowa, and they'd be out standing in the middle of a cornfield or in front of a barn, and all of us would go, you're not in Des Moines. Um, so we created this caucus consortium for a couple of reasons. One, to create a better buzz for the media. We're a great resource for them. Contact us. Um, we can give you locations to shoot from, locations to do the Today Show on, whatever it is. Um, we also do a big event every year, the weekend before the caucus, just for the media, called the Rockus Before the Caucus. Simply just a big cocktail reception that we throw for them. But it's nice for them because here they are all away from their families and from all sides of the world, so it's a, it's a good PR thing. We run a bunch of different caucus um, um, Programs where we'll bring in actual candidates, um, speaking engagements, and um, an array of different things throughout the year. So we're very active in that. You know, the, the press is how to be nationally and locally. Well, so what's the true economic impact? It's so difficult for us to quantify because we don't know if uh, Buttigieg is in town, you know, this week and where they're staying, how many people will bring them, and all that. But it's, it's a, a huge amount. You look at a year like this year has been with all the candidates, all the activity we had with the Iowa State Fair, um, just really all year long there's been some type of, of candidate activity in, in the city. So Yeah, it'll kind of fade after February 3rd, I suppose. Yeah, it'll fade drastically, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Bigger fish yeah. out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Good question, Greg. Do you guys account for Airbnb? Is that part of what your number count? How does that work? You know, we are working on um, the MAC group, the metropolitan area, what's the C, council? Um, Kurt Gauss from uh, Pleasant Hill has kind of led the charge on that. And I've sat on that committee, and they're trying to come up with some new ordinances that cities might be able to either manipulate yourself, but kind of give you at least a boilerplate on how to work with the Airbnbs. Um, you know, the state law says that yes, they do have to pay hotel motel tax. Are they all doing that? If you talk to Airbnb, Airbnb corporate, they say yes, if they book their rooms through them. But you know, there's others that may have Airbnbs and I may know, you know, Jane Smith and just call her directly and then she's gonna charge me whatever, probably not pay you tax. Um, We'd like to work more closely with them. You know, when they first came out, hotel, hoteliers, specifically across the country, hated them. 
but it's it's kind of like Uber, you know. It's here, it's gonna stay. You know, my kids, I know when they travel, they stay at Airbnbs, you know, so it's kind of a new thing. So we're trying to develop more relationships and with that. <coughs> Thank you all for what you're doing, and thanks for the new speed one that I made it here in record time. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. <coughs> Dream, if I could just mention on this, you know, that newsletter maybe it's helpful to add portions of that to our Could be. That would be a good thing. Caleb? Caleb and Ord from United Way. Yes, I'm going to keep it old school and hang out with some literature instead of a PowerPoint. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here. I appreciate it. I will be brief. Um, I just quickly wanted to go over a little bit of United Way schools, United Way of Central Iowa. We serve Polk Horn and Dallas counties. Uh, so again, super excited to just quickly share with you some goals that we've set for 2020. Um, on the brochure that I'm handing out, it's our community impact report. But I just quickly want to share the story of this phenomenal woman that's on the cover of it. Her name is Ronnie. Um, there's a little bit more about her story inside. But Ronnie was, uh, she had to make the difficult decision of, do I continue to pay for my textbooks? Because she's going to, uh, she's trying to be a nurse. She's going to nursing school. Or do I put a down payment on my apartment? Uh, she made the difficult decision and decided to pay the textbooks. And uh, we found out about it. She ended up living in her car. She was breaking out in hives because studying to be a nurse is stressful, let alone living in your car while you're doing it. Uh, we found out about it, and we got her referred and enrolled in our Central Iowa Health Works program. We were able to get her connected with resources, not only so that she could put her hard-earned funds towards an apartment and that we could help with her education, but we were also able to get her support. Uh, so that way, you know, again, studying for nursing school is really hard. So uh, we were able to get her support so that way she can do that, uh, go through that with some of that support. But she is now a nurse at Mercy One, so super excited uh, to continue to share her story. It's, that's just a really quick snapshot of it. You can read a little bit more about it, but super proud to have her in our community, and she's just one of the stories. She's just one of the individuals uh, here in Central Iowa that uh, has been impacted by the programs funded through United Way. Uh, so quickly, to kind of walk through this brochure a little bit, United Way fights for three things, and that's the health, education, and financial stability of every central island. And by central Iowa, again, that's Polk Horn and Dallas counties. In education, uh, we're working to get towards 95% of central, I central Iowans who graduate from high school. Uh, we're very confident we're going to meet that goal by 2020. Uh, we, we've done the math, and we have anticipated that being about 90 to 100 more students that we have to graduate from last year this year and we'll hit that goal. So again, super excited. We've got a big push for 2020 within the school systems, uh, but we know that graduation rates start, grad and graduating in general starts way before just the four years that you start high school. It starts all the way back in third grade. That's the highest predictor uh, if you graduate high school. And so you'll see a lot of initiatives that we have, volunteer opportunities uh, and different activities with the schools that focus on that third grade reading, because again, that's one of the high predictors. In income or financial stability, uh, we're working towards 75% of Central Islands who are financially self-sufficient. Uh, we kind of trended in the wrong direction for a little bit. Uh, we set these goals though back in about 2008-2009, kind of a rough time for the uh, recession going on to set these goals. But for the last two years, we've been trending in the right direction. And we have seen an uptick of 2% of Central Islands who are more financially self-sufficient. That equates to 25,000 people, which I think is just pretty amazing that 25,000 more folks here in our communities are financially self-sufficient. Uh, that Central Iowa Health Works program that I mentioned that Ron was in also falls under our income or financial stability work. So you can read a little bit about uh, the Central Iowa Works program as well. And then in health, we, uh, we're really focusing on those five well-being factors. And the one that we're really focusing on this year is uh, purpose because we know that purpose in your career specifically uh, leads to better health. We know that purpose is, we've seen that it's, that's decreasing, it starts to decrease and pull down all of the other four well-being factors as well. So we've got this purpose initiative that we're gonna be uh, hopefully here releasing and talking a little bit more about here in 2020 
Uh, but super excited to talk a little bit more about it and, and get folks really engaged within their workforce so that way they can continue to be uh, highly engaged in their workplace and highly engaged in the community. And then all along the bottom of this uh, pamphlet, you'll see the essential needs, and essential needs focuses on that health, transportation, and housing. And it's strategically placed under all three because we know that it's hard to be successful in health, education, or financial stability if your essential needs are not met. Uh, and so with this, again, just wanted to briefly, I know there's a lot of information in here uh, to share with you guys, but just wanted to quickly share with you a little bit about that uh, about our goals and our goals that we're reaching towards 2020. Uh, if there's an opportunity for uh, you guys as individuals or within your own workplaces with city employees to be involved with either campaign or volunteering or advocating, uh, we'd love to be able to get you resources and connected with, with the folks at our offices that can help you do that. Again, I want to be real quick because I know there's a whole lot in there and I got a busy agenda. But if there is any questions, I'm happy to answer any. Any questions? Thank you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Has anything that you'd like to address? Come to the podium. Name, address. Don't need your phone number. But Thank you. Next item is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Bill Singer? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Lafredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Barnes? Thank you. Yes. Old business is consideration of resolution 191107, updating the guidelines and policies for Windsor Heights Community Center. No. Uh, this is just a follow up from the discussion that we had at the uh, last council meeting make some changes to our, our guidelines and whatnot. So uh, we got it right up in there. We've uh, pared down our guidelines by quite a bit. Are there any questions? I don't know if anyone else thinks it may be prudent. Um, I see that you put in that with regards to the uh, Discount or rental, the, the fees may be waived by the city council. I didn't know if um, we should put in there, if you should put in there, or, uh, like a time frame or something to indicate to people who are looking into it. You know, city council obviously when it meets our, our meetings are set, um, so you're going to need to you're going to need to ask for permission. You know, thirty whatever, thirty days, sixty days in advance. Um, I just thought maybe that might be something to put in there as a guideline for people so if they don't, well, my meeting's on Monday, you know, or, or, or whatever. Let's see what that uh, Aren't you looking for a 60, 60 day advance anyway? Uh, I mean, you can look at tomorrow if you want to. Okay. But if, if you want to get a waiver, I think, I mean, 30 days. That's what, that's what I'm referring yeah, to. Yeah, but I thought there were some about 60 days in there. Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff in the past 60 days, but that's. 30 days for the year. Yeah. It's 30 days position. What does the 60 yes. days mean? I guess so the 30 days, 60 days is when you want to have full payment in. And if you cancel your event within 60 days, we're keeping our money. And that's pretty in line with other event venues. Um, is 30, 30 days or is that all right to you guys? That's in fun for me. Any further discussion? Entertain a motion to also include that uh, change on the 30 day waiver. Somebody would make a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call. Yes. yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Afraid Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Farms? Yes. Next item is new business consideration of resolution 191108. Approving the 2020 Health Insurance Renewal and Capital Benefits Administration contract. 
Tricia Birmingham, yeah. who is our advisor, is here to give us a brief description. You received an email last week, which I think maybe the basic cuts of what we're doing. So I'll get a question here, Jim, and answer that one. Um, so you see the attachments, I'm assuming, and we're still, the city is still on what we call a grandmother plan. Um, so pre-ACA, not age rated, and we are, I should say, rolling with two plans. One is for the union, one is for the non-union. Um, this year there is a decrease on those premiums, 1.98% um, on both of those plans. So we did, um, there was a committee that met and I believe it was just employees, correct? And um, we, you know, said that the best, probably the best um, uh, way to go this year would be just to take the grandmother plan with a decrease, and um, and then just hopefully that the grandmother status would still hold for next year. So, any questions about that? So we no did, change in benefits. We did have employees represented, and this is being discussed. Yes. Yes. So we, yes. Uh, are there other examples of municipalities that have the same plan? Um, as far as, are you talking about grandmother plans or? Yeah, just exactly like this one that we're talking uh, about. Not that I'm aware. I mean, not that so I. We're the only ones. Most, most of the grandmother plans have went away okay. because they had to move because of premiums or whatever the case may be. So there's no way of comparing costs with a different municipality using a similar plan. Um, I, that wouldn't, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we've done that, at least when I was involved in the process a couple of years ago, we, that was what we did. We looked to see what were, um, how did it compare with what, you know, Waukee and West Des Moines and what kind of benefits did they offer and what was the cost and what was the copay mm -hmm. of each, I mean, did, did they have a, did they make a contribution or not? And that's when we made some significant changes a couple of years ago, but, um, in addition to that, uh, your comments, just asking a question about um, whether or not the grandmother, grandfather, whatever kind of plan you want to call it, um, whether what's the likelihood of that, I mean, if it's available, fantastic. Yeah. Um, obviously, it always depends on the rates and those sorts of things. So I, I guess I didn't realize, I thought that they had all, they were all to have gone away already. Yeah, no, they, uh, Congress keeps extending the grandmother okay. plans. So. Wellmark is telling us this year that they are not um, lobbying this year to keep them. So I don't know what that, to them, that means that they're not going to be approved if there's not somebody in there fighting to keep those. So it's just kind of kind of go to rest and those will just go away. So is that's what they're anticipating, Wellmark is. So. Trees, I remember the comparisons. Oh, okay. But it's a new year. Yes, it will, exactly. And so that, that's my interest in yeah. having something out there. Uh, just so our, our employees are, are fine with that, do we, do we have uh, health savings accounts available to our people? We have what's called a health reimbursement arrangement, which is a deductible buy-down. Okay. We don't have a standard HSA where we give money to, where the city gives money to employees that accumulates in a savings account. But we do have flexible spending where the employees can put in pre-tax dollars. Yeah. Uh, for these yeah. type of for like a cafeteria yeah. 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 how many people take a significant number take advantage of that i'm hoping more will be yeah. by changing to a different servicer yeah. but do quite a few participate in this um, i'm not sure do you know i think there was maybe a handful just a few yeah. yeah you know i would just want to make sure the employees understand that's available and what can what it can do for them yeah uh, and now I'm talking about Travis. Uh, let me finish. Sure. That our department head, that Chad talked to the police and fire, and Dalton talked to the public works people, and so forth, um, and have that discussion. Because I think it's really important, um, bottom dollar for the employees to take advantage of that. Uh, so, with a handful of people in there. Um, I think we. I think you need to address that again with the employees. What nice benefit? We'll make sure that all the employees are so. aware of the options that are available. Please, please, please do, do that. Okay. I think that's traditionally been done at a staff meeting in the past. So. Every year we do a staff meeting, and um, we do have the whoever's representing those benefits. They do come in and discuss that. So, which is the other item um, that was sent out was also that changing who administers those benefits. 
Uh, so from right now it's Benefits Inc. And then that will change um, as of 1-1 to cable as of, as of right now. Cable business services. Any further discussion? Motion to be approved. So, Second. Roll call. Bill Henry. Yes. Joseph Jones. Yes. Alfredo. Yes. Mike Jones. Yes. Charles. Yes. Consideration resolution 191109, resolution authorizing intergovernmental transfer of public funds agreement between Iowa DHS and the City of Windsor Heights. So this is a, a new program that uh, several other states already have implemented, and several states are still working to implement it, but it, it's called GEMT, or Ground Emergency Medical Transport. And basically, the goal of this at the, the state and federal level is to bridge the gap between uh, what we receive for Medicaid payments, so not Medicare, not private insurance, not self-paid, but Medicaid only, uh, bridge the gap between Medicaid payments as to what we receive versus what our actual costs are incurred in transporting someone. Currently, the state of Iowa pays 100, or well, not necessarily the state, the state and federal government pay $123 per transport, and as you all know, it costs much more than that to operate a service. Um, the first uh, year of this, the state has developed an amount of $1,183 of the average uncompensated cost that they're basing the reimbursements off of. And then uh, going forward, we'll have a spreadsheet that we have our, our budget information and our uh, number of calls we make, how long we spend on those calls, things of that nature. And then that will give uh, each service an average cost per transport, and then whatever the difference is between what Medicaid pays and that average cost of transport will be on our number for the next year. Um, we get 60% of this, the state gets 40% of it. Uh, as you can see on the second page, uh, or the first page of council action form, in 2017 we had 37 Medicaid transports, 2018 we were at 41, so far this year, year to date we're at 45, so we're going up a couple each year. Um, there's some confusion over how the 40% is paid initially. We thought we got reimbursed 100% from the federal government. Then the intergovernmental <coughs> transfer, which is what the resolution is using that, that pathway. Um, and then last week or two weeks ago, we were told that we may have to pay that up front uh, before we get it back, but it'll be reimbursed to us. We're still working through that, and there's some more training going on with this. Uh, so, are you, are you saying maybe you have to pay the state before you get yes. the reimbursement? The, the problem is that it's a, a, it's a federal program that has a state gateway. So it has to go through the state and draw down the federal money. And the state apparently uh, doesn't have or uh, desire to put the 40% up to get the drawdown of the other 60%. And so they're working through whether we're going to have to guess what our numbers are going to be for the month of prepay or how that's going to work. So we're not real sure on that, but uh, what, what you're approving tonight is the first step of us being able to enroll in the plan, and that's simply that intergovernmental transfer pathway uh, for that 40%, however it works out. Yeah, because Chad, the 1183 versus the number is the number. I mean, it, it amounts to about uh, over $700. 7980 is our 60%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a voluntary program. We do not have to participate in it. However, you can see uh, my estimates are somewhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand in revenue. Uh, it, I think, would be silly for us not to participate in it. <laughs> no problem. But I'm going to try to work through the cost reporting myself to save from paying a contractor to do that. Uh, hopefully, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But we have to do this before we do anything, and I have to do the cost reports if we even want to think about it. So that's why it's. Brought to you. Okay, thank you. Question? Motion? Second. Roll call. Bill Zenner? Yes. Bill Jones? Yes. Alfredo? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Arms? Yes. Next item is consideration of resolution 191110, resolution approving building inspection services. We have two representatives from Safe Building here to answer any questions that the council members may have about how they do their work. So, if you have any questions about them, they're here to answer those. 
So I just I read quickly through the um, the service agreement, and so just to verify, so it says that we're entering a one year um, agreement, and that we can um, terminate within thirty days. But Mark, in a conversation I had with you, you stated that we're only billed for the services that that they do right and it's not, we will yes. call them we will call them they won't get receive calls from right okay other people and then uh, because I also saw somewhere here um, fielding inquiries um, taking calls from property owners and contracted contractors, those sorts of things. So I don't know if that's a, like, I guess, I mean, sure some of those things maybe have to happen. I guess I just don't want property owners, owners calling them and asking them to come and do things without the city knowing what's going on, right? Go ahead, no, yeah. So my conversations with uh, Jeff, uh, this is Jeff and Ron here, they're only going to be doing the work that we send their way. So the homeowners won't be calling and racking up a bill. Uh, they're only going to be doing work that we have collected permit fees on. Uh, and so this is a net neutral cost for us. We're still going to be collecting revenues on the permit fees. And I can't remember the exact split, but we're still going to retain a small portion of those. So uh, the remainder of those permit fees will cover their costs for the inspection services. So, um, and they will be people that, that currently hold building permits will be re requesting their inspections directly through these guys for the time being. So we won't be playing this telephone game where they're going to call me and need an inspection and I'll call these guys that hey, need an inspection and then just call them directly, keep an MA out of it. Um, and these are only on projects that uh, I'm unsuited to handle. So commercial or large scale. <coughs> large, sorry. <coughs> but we're large scale. Residential remodels. So, sorry. Don't have that social matter. Don't. 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 These, we're contracting these guys to handle professional services kind of things. So I think that adjusting our permit fee schedules would be more of a policy thing and that would be handled by um, staff. So we're not talking about like a homeowner coming out of Europe or something like that. Technically, we do request a permit or require a permit for a career. Yeah, I understand. Service. So yeah, they, they would do that or they would do the inspection. Well, I, I could do that one, but I'm really more concerned about, for example, like the Five Learning Academy doing the inspections on yeah, yeah, the commercial. So yeah. um, I've done a couple of re-roof inspections, um, decks, driveway, stuff that I can handle on the continuing handle. Okay. I mean, I just know because I've got complaints about the permit process in the past. If, but it's from homeowners. If you get more complaints, please let me know. Well, I've already let you know I'm just yes. in the past. Yes. Uh, so I'm just wondering where they go. Uh, we address them with the homeowner. And I believe that the complaints <laughs> are the ones that I've dealt with anyway have been <coughs> to homeowner satisfaction. Yeah, I'm not questioning that. That's past. Right. I'm talking about currently. The homeowners, these gentlemen in this company, do they go directly to them or through us? They go to us. Go to us. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Okay. So am I misspeaking for you guys? No, no we're, we're basically here to support. You can okay. yeah. set that up however you like. If you'd like to establish builders, contact us directly and set up appointments for the inspection of permitted projects. That's, that's great. Uh, if you've got if you, citizens come to you, um, the next question you can, you can support that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I always so would like our residents to have a due process approach if they, they're concerned about something, they can get the answers to those. Uh, where, where it goes, I don't know if it's that important, but if we want people to be satisfied with the question being answered. Any questions? Are there any questions? That's the same. Yes. 
motion to approve. So Second. Bill Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Afraid of? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. Ann Harms? Yes. Next item is setting a public hearing for proposed ordinance 1911, which will amend chapter 60 07 <coughs> truck routes. We need a motion to set the public hearing for December 2nd at 6 p.m. So I'll move. Sorry. Roll call. Bill yes, Henry? Yes. Joseph Jones? Yes. Afraid of? Yes. Mike Jones? Yes. All right. Yes. Next item is should we move the next the meeting February 3rd, 2020 to February 4th, 2020 due to the Iowa caucus? Of course we should. <laughs> of course we should. Need a motion to do approve that. Unless there's any discussion. Okay. Roll call. Yes, Henry. Yes, Joseph Jones. Yes. Fredo. Yes. Mike Jones. Yes. Farms. Yes. We okay, make the note. It will be February fourth, not February third. Next item is for discussion only commercial tax abatements. We've had some discussion on that briefly. Uh, we have never gone forward with it. We probably should discuss it. Mike, did you start this at one time or question it? No, it's actually Mark's fault. He brought it up. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so they get going. Um, well, no. What happened was I inquired with Mark about the uh, the herd property over on 73rd or 63rd, and uh, Hickman. You know, following an update with him about um, you know, if anything was happening. And I guess the short answer is no. Um. And he suggested, or he brought up, that um, many communities in the metro have uh, commercial tax abatement programs. And by uh, many, it's, at least at first glance, it's Des Moines, Adel, Pleasant Hill, Norwalk, Bondurant, Joaquin, and there, there probably are others, but that, that's just what I looked at. We actually have one under residential, which uh, I didn't know at first. Uh, because it's nowhere clearly laid out on the website and um, it's completely different than any other sort of residential tax abatement program in the metro from what I looked up for these other cities. Um, I think more or less the standard laid out in from these other these other cities and the standard comes from the code is that um, for new commercial or industrial structures, new buildings, or if the value is increased by 15%, there's an abatement from either one to three or one to five years um, with a decreasing percentage of the abatement. And that's from both the city programs, but it's primarily from the, the code. Um, so, I was just bringing it forward as a suggestion. I think we all campaigned on economic development, and that hasn't exactly blown up uh, in any recent election. Um, so it was just something I thought I'd bring to the table to discuss. I certainly don't like, um, you know, what we read in the news about Facebook or Apple or now Amazon basically get, being given the farm by cities, um, but. It fits us one more tool, a standard tool that we could use to potentially encourage um, some sort of development at a commercial level. I'd encourage us just to look at it. Or I talked with the Taxpayers Association, uh, Mark and David are there. Anyway, we talked to different cities. Des Moines is an example. Des Moines is dealing with a lot of blighted properties. That's the main thing, I think. Right now. Ankeny doesn't do any of those, as I recall, because he can't even keep up with the growth. And Von Durant has it, and they have a, uh, I think it's a six year plan, three year plan, for three years, 100% for three years, and the six year is 80%. 80%. 
Well, it's a declining scale. So it goes down. It starts at 80 year grant. It goes down to 10 years a year. But I, you know, and that's that was a private land where that Amazon It wasn't city land. And so the city wanted to then get involved with it uh, to provide some inducement. I don't know if you were there then, Mark, or not. No, that's all close to me. I can't take any credit or blame. Okay. But um, so it wasn't, it wasn't like the city owned land, it was her property. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the 63rd University is coming up, or the Sherwood Forest Corner here, or the 66th University thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that would be a good case study of how Bond ran a that with soliciting that. And I don't, I'm, sure, I'm sure it wasn't just the city that approached the members. Um, well, I can tell you from my past life that Bondurant's had that program for a long, long, long time, way before I even was there. And uh, it's it's offered to any business that fits the description of the eligible businesses. You, you can have a 100,000 building or a 100,000 dollar building or a 100 million dollar building if it's a big program. It's a, it's a commercial industrial facility. But I, I think it's certainly worthy consideration, oh, yeah. and, and it certainly is we're trying to get those properties occupied, we're trying to help get those properties occupied, and it certainly is a worthy consideration. Anyone else? <clears throat> I think we talked about it in the economic development before. It's not something that we feel most of We'll take it to committee and discuss it deeply and bring back staff input. Yeah, good. Mark? Yep, yeah, we will pursue it. You know, I, it, kind of on this topic, I just think it had nothing to do with the bait much. But there's, uh, for Alabama Conference, Star Conference, at the state thing, they, they had some uh, marketing <coughs> consultants there. And it's pretty enlightening, really, because there's there's factors of, uh, that are affecting the marketing in your city, and there are factors that aren't. And they've got, kind of got to prioritize. Uh, for example, and this surprised me uh, when they talked about uh, um, city parks and the amenity things. It had no effect on players uh, coming into the city. They want to know the location, available workforce, and, and uh, any and structure of the if they develop in that, that city. Uh, so I mean, I think we should maybe have to work to a consultant or something too in terms of marketing. Well, didn't we just spend money on the pitch book? So we know what we just did. The pitch book. Yeah. I think it's relevant to the discussion some of the time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's fine. You can bring you can make it your committee as far as I'm concerned. But I just think it's kind of an add in to what you were talking about. Okay, that's fine then. Okay. Next item reports. No. No. Mike. Um Dalton, Veterans Day. Very enjoyable. Um, we apparently have a first time, not first time, long time coming um, communications meeting on the 4th of December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, looking forward to that. Three. Um, Metro Waste is on Wednesday. Um, so I will go to that and so, and congratulations to Dalton on a successful merchant and stay in program. So thanks for being here. Please convey to the uh, MWA that the presentation that was given at the uh, MAC meeting was very <coughs> interesting and informative. Very good. I came and uh, explained a lot of the stuff that they were going to be doing, but. I would look forward to a um, 
report from you at a later point that uh, all the stuff that's going on. If you would, please. We can certainly have them come in and do that. Ideas, updates on, on things that we. Maybe we should do that. Um, Teresa, do you want to fire? I, don't want to I think it was a very good, a very informative meeting to a lot of the adjacent communities and whatever, but I think it would be beneficial for all of us to hear it directly. We had a MILAG meeting, which is Metro Iowa Local Association of Governments, this week, and we had nine legislators there, and they sort of <clears throat> informed us as to what some of their priorities were going to be and it's like mental health, water, taxes. And after we got done with those three items, it wasn't a whole lot more conversations, business as usual. Um, They're cutting all of them or? No, no, no. They're trying to figure out how to allocate better. Okay. We all know how that has been in the past, so we look forward to more. Mark, you got uh, some information on budget? Uh, yes. Um, it appears that the FY21 tax rate can be reduced by more than the 69 cents referenced in the lost pre bill materials. I'm waiting for confirmation from the city's financial advisor about the doability of some ideas that I'm planning to use to further reduce the tax rate. I expect to have more to report on this at the December 2nd meeting. Also, the city's finance director will be starting on December 2nd and having Rochelle here will help with trying out different scenarios. I expect to receive preliminary evaluation information from the county, from the county assessor's office in the first week or so of December. Having that information will also help with reviewing different options. We're still fairly early in the process and are staying on target with the dates I set off in the October 12th budget development timeline. That timeline states that the preliminary FY21 budget the tax rate will be reported to the council on December 13th. At this point, that is still a realistic expectation. Mark, so the departments have given the request yes, to you? Yes, I have. Okay, good. Okay. Mark, is there any update on the 63rd University? Just, I know there was an RFP. Is that time elapsed? Or? Oh, yes, that's several months ago. There, was, there were no respondents, but I can tell you that I received an email, so I don't today from a commercial realtor who the church is interested in using to list their properties and they've asked some questions and I will be getting them the answers to those questions tomorrow. Anything further from Mark or Travis? Mm -hmm. um, I just put in the um, <laughs> you know, um, financial report. Um, this is published and then filed with the auditor of state once we get the publication back. Um, working with the final um, stages of the audit with um, Marvin last week and this week, and he will be here to present on the 16th of December. That's it. I'm sorry, what day did you say? 16th. Is that the second meeting? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Uh, the the Arkansas are my favorite board is included in the package. I think we're both all fine. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I do have a couple of things that were not budget related here. Sure. Just bear with me for a minute. Uh, according to City Engineer Justin Ernst, the schedule for the College Allison 69th Street Street Reconstruction Project called for its approval of the plans at the December the January 6th meeting. Been opening on February 11th and been awarded at the during the February 17th council meeting. All work is scheduled to be completed by the end of the 2020 construction season. Bids are scheduled to be opened by the DOT for the University Avenue project on February 18th. It usually takes a month or two to go through the DOT contract approval process. The project should be open to traffic, but possibly not 100% complete by the end of 2020 construction season. The College Allison 69th and University Effort Projects combined have an estimated cost of $16.7 million. This is a fairly aggressive amount from a financing perspective. Staff has had several meetings with the city's financial advisor, Tiana Poole, <coughs> on structuring the debt for these projects. There is a way to finance all of this work, but it will probably involve a somewhat unconventional approach. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It will just be different from what people are used to. 
As I've mentioned in the past, it's usually not a good idea to delay construction projects because they only become more expensive in the future. I hope to have a description of the financing plan for these projects at one of the December meetings. And uh, to the council members, please remember your appointments with the city administrator search consultant, Charlene Stevens, for tomorrow. Let me know if you need, need a reminder on the time. Thank you. Or can I just ask on that? That's 16 plus million dollars. Right. That was for what university? That's that's for four streets. It's university and then college, 69th, and Allison. Okay. College okay. Allison and 69th are being bid as one project. The university okay. is being bid as one project. But I kind of imagine Justin has those broken down between project and not. Yes. Uh, don't say yes. Sure so yeah, yeah. You know, okay, okay, then I see that. And yes, I have seen you know, there are separate estimates for each street. If you want to know, I can tell you what they are. Yeah, I agree with you. The longer we delay, the more expensive it gets. Pay me now or pay me later. Oh, you got anything more to say? Uh, just <clears throat> written report if you have any questions on that. Any questions for Dolan? Next item is closed session pursuant to Iowa Code 21 H 5 to discuss strategy with council on matters that are presently in litigation where litigation is imminent. <coughs> where disclosure would be likely to prejudice and disadvantage the position of the government body in that litigation. Motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. Roll call. Well, Henry. Yes. Those Jones. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mike Jones. Yes. 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 Yes.